I'm Matthew Burchette, and this is Behind the Wings. And this episode is on America's iconic B-52 bomber, baby! This program was made possible by Wings Over the Rockies, educating and inspiring people of all ages about aviation and space endeavors of the past, present, and future. Now I say this a lot, but how cool is this? You guys are getting a really inside look at this thing. Not everyone gets to do that. Bam! 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 <laughs> Welcome to Behind the Wings. My name is Matthew Burchette. I'm the curator at Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum in wonderful Denver, Colorado. And get ready to learn about some of the most iconic aircraft ever learn about some really cool aviation history, and generally come away with just an amazing appreciation for aerospace in general. You're not gonna wanna miss this. The B-52 Stratofortress came to life in 1945 when the United States Army Air Forces needed to expand its bomber capabilities. In 1955, the first Stratofortresses were delivered to the 93rd Bomb Wing at Castle Air Force Base in California. As America's big stick of diplomacy, the nuclear-capable B-52 was the nation's main Soviet deterrent during the Cold War. Designed to fly deep into Soviet territory to strike cities and industry with nuclear weapons, B-52s were on constant airborne alert from 1960 to 1968. Luckily, the big bomber never dropped a nuclear weapon in combat, but it certainly saw extensive action during the Vietnam War. With the lessons learned in Vietnam, America began to look for a replacement for the aging B-52. While the XB-70 Valkyrie and F-111 Aardvark were slated to fill the role of the Strata Fortress, neither aircraft lived up to their hype, and the B-52 soldiered on. Even with the debut of the B-1 Lancer, the B-52 remained a part of America's nuclear triad. With continuous upgrades, the last B-52s manufactured in 1965 are still serving our country and are planned to serve until at least 2045. All right, that's enough chit chat. Let's go explore the second oldest B-52 Strata Fortress anywhere. Hey, welcome to this episode of Behind the Wings, which we're highlighting the B-52 bomber here at Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum. If you've ever been to our museum, you certainly can't miss this monstrosity out front. But what you may not know are some of the salient features of this aircraft. Take, for example, the wingspan. That's 185 feet wide. Now, for comparison's sake, that's nearly two B-17 bombers from World War II. How nuts is that? But even more nuts, the length. She's 159 feet long, which is nine feet longer than our B-1A Lancer that we have inside. But guess what? Speaking of inside, we got places to go, baby. We decided to whew, start at the end and work our way forward. So we are actually in the gunner's position of a B-52B. And uh, I will say this, there's a distinct smell about old planes. And uh, I know there's some guys out there that know what I'm talking about. I, I can't place it, but it's kind of funky. The B-52B was equipped with a quad 50 caliber machine gun turret, just like this one, but it had a radar gun sight. Now, as the B-52 got older and more complex, they went to a 20 millimeter cannon and finally to a 20 millimeter Gatling gun, and there was nobody that actually sat back here at all, and now they don't even have a gunner's station. 
Did you know that the B-52 bomber is the largest airplane to have an aerial kill? It's true. 24 December 1972, the crew of Diamond Lil encountered a MiG-21 fighter over North Vietnam, and the rear gunner shot it down with its 450 caliber machine guns, just like we have here. Now, you'll notice that this is not a large compartment, and you may or may not notice there's no ejection seat. So how did this guy get out? Well, guess what? There is a handle right here but it's not for an ejection seat. It just makes the entire end of the turret fall away from the plane, which means that the guy just had to dive right out. Uh-uh, not gonna happen. Now, as much as I like being back here, because there is so much to look at, there's even more to look at up front. So let's make our way to the cockpit section, because we got a lot to talk about there. As I crawl through our B-52, there are some things you need to know about this aircraft like the fact that our B-52 is 64 years old. There's a saying in the B-52 community that goes, this is your grandfather's B-52, which means it's possible that pilots today are flying the exact same plane their fathers flew. That's nuts! No other aircraft in the U.S. arsenal has that kind of legacy. Okay, we've made it to the navigator's position. Yay! No more crawling! We're actually back here in what they call the black hole. And you can kind of see why. Not a lot of ways to look out of these tiny little windows. There's one here and one over to my right. But this is where the radar navigator sat, and just to my right was where the navigator sat. Now that sounds redundant, but in 1950s parlance, the radar navigator was actually the bombardier. And if you look at some of this equipment around me, you start seeing special weapons in ASM lock, and internal bomb indicator light control, you know, all that kind of cool stuff. But right in front of me is actually the large radar screen that the bombardier would use to figure out where the target was and when exactly to drop, in this case, usually a nuclear weapon. Luckily, the B-52 never dropped a nuclear weapon in combat. Now, if you want to stay safe in a super scary environment, you definitely need a good EWO. He lived above us. Let's go see what he did. So we're up on the flight deck now. We've gone up a level from where we were before, and we're in the EWO station. And if you remember correctly, EWO stands for Electronic Warfare Officer. Now, when the B-52 was created, it was really meant to go straight into the Soviet Union and, and bomb cities and large factories and that kind of thing. Well, the Soviets knew we were probably going to come, and they had an amazing anti-aircraft system set up with triple A batteries, which is anti-aircraft artillery, and SAMs, and that was the big threat, the surface-to-air missile. They had the SA-2, which was an amazing piece of equipment. It didn't do great for us, but it was great for the Soviets. So the EWO was there to counter that threat. One of the things that he had at his disposal was the ALQ-117, and it was a suite of electronics that could literally prioritize all the threats coming at this plane. In fact, the EWOs like to say that it worked auto-magically, which is kind of cool when you think about it, but it was a deadly game that they were playing because the Soviets were launching missiles from the ground and from their aircraft to try to take down these bombers, and the EWO was trying to jam their radars, throw off their heat-seeking missiles, and generally, keep themselves alive and get back home. But how would you get back home? Let's move up front and let's see where the pilot and co-pilot were. To my left is where the pilot would sit and I'm sitting where the co-pilot would sit. Now, one of the things you're probably looking at already is there are a lot of bells and whistles in here. You gotta remember the B-52 had eight engines, which means eight throttle levers and all of these gauges for the corresponding engines. You've got fuel flow, you've got RPM, exhaust temperature, pressure ratio, all these kind of stuff that, you know, you don't have to look at a lot, but you definitely got to keep your eye on. The stuff you really need to keep your eye on, luckily, like any other plane, is always right in front of you. It's the six-pack. 
It's your turn and bank indicator. It's your altitude. It's your airspeed. All that important stuff that you really need to know to fly. Now, one of the other things you're probably noticing is some of this stuff looks kind of beat up. Well, there's a reason for that. In 1998, a gentleman came by before Lowry was really well populated. He climbed up on a ladder and he doused the cockpit section with gasoline and he lit this plane on fire. Now, why did he do that? Well, he was protesting America's landmine policy. Now, what does landmines have to do with B-52s? I got no clue, but in his mind, it made perfect sense. Luckily, he was caught and this plane had some damage to it, to the tune of about $250,000, but luckily our volunteer corps came to the rescue and was able to repair this plane. Otherwise, sadly, she probably would have gone to the scrap heap. Not a really fitting end for such an amazing plane. So as I sit here, I'm struck by how much of the original equipment is still in here, all the gauges and dials, and it gets me to thinking, what's the difference between a 64-year-old B-52 and a B-52 that, well, is maybe 60 years old, but is still flying for the Air Force. I know there've got to be changes, you know, technological advances and whatnot, but luckily there is an Air Force base not too far from here that still flies B-52. So I'm thinking, why not my not? Okay, so you can tell we are no longer in Colorado. We're in Minot, North Dakota. Everything you've ever heard about it is true. It's cold out here and I've only been here a couple of hours, but Minot is also home to the 23rd and 69th bomb squadrons that fly the B-52 like the ones we have up front, except mucho modernized. And we are gonna see some of that stuff up close and personal. But right now, we're gonna go talk to the base historian because I'm freezing, so let's go! Did you know that Minot Air Force Base is one of two B-52 bases in the United States and also one of the areas where we store some of our nuclear munitions? In fact, if this base were to secede from the United States, it would be the third largest nuclear power in the world. Minot Air Force Base is also home to over 5,000 military personnel who have access to their own grocery store, neighborhoods, and even a fitness facility. <laughs> now it's time to meet up with the historian Rob Michael to understand how B-52s and the 5th Bomb Wing found their home in Minot, North Dakota. So give me a little bit of background on the 5th Bomb Wing. How did it get here? What did it do before it got here? So the, the fifth is a really old unit. It started out in 1919 at Luke Field in Hawaii. If you ever look at an overhead image of Battleship Row, right, that's Ford's Island, and right. that was actually Luke Field. So the fifth is kind of famous because they bombed a volcano. They did. Moana Loa. Give us a brief overview of what the heck that was all about. It's an interesting story and it's debatable on whether or not it worked. So the volcano was erupting, and the, the bomb group happened to be there, right, at Luke Field. So a scientist mm -hmm. came up with the idea to actually bomb the lava tubes to save the city of Hilo from the volcano. The 23rd and 72nd got in their keystone bombers. Yeah, the keystones. The keystones and decided to uh, drop some bombs on the flow. So. That sounds like something right out of an episode of Gilligan's Island. Exactly. That's just kind of goofy. Now that we've got the fifth bomb wing established, when did it come to Minot and, and why Minot? Well, the shortest path to Russia or to the Soviet Union is over the pole. Right. So all these northern tier bases that were being built were kind of usurped by SAC, right, and taken over. Okay. You know, and SAC said, hey, let's put some bombers up there. How does the Air Force come around and just grab the land? Is it, is it literally a land grab? and just say, hey, we're the Air Force and we get to do what we do, or is there a process? So the citizens of Minot decided, heard that the Air Force was shopping North Dakota to put in an Air Force installation. So the residents and the local business owners said, hey, this is gonna be a great thing for the city, right? It's gonna bring us a lot of money. Those local businesses and 
the citizens donated fifty thousand dollars in the late fifties no to buy the land where Midnight Air Force Base sits. I just don't see that happening today. <laughs> I, I don't even. That's amazing. All right, so I'm standing here in Dock 8, which in Air Force parlance means, well, hangar. And this guy is Captain Arpin. Now, you're actually a B-52 pilot. That's correct. That is very cool. Before we get to that, tell us about where we're standing. So Dock 8, uh, as you said, a hangar is one of our more recently uh, built hangars. And uh, as you can see behind us, we do have one B-52 currently in the yeah. hangar. There's actually room for an entire another B-52 in this hangar so that maintenance operations can continue even when the weather is bad outside. That is nuts. And considering Minot, North Dakota in the winter, you don't really want to be doing that stuff no, outside. So tell me a little bit about yourself. How long have you been flying the B-52? Uh, five years in the B-52 now, or closer to six, but uh, five years here up in Minot. How do you like it? Uh, I, it's a lot of fun, I tell you what. Yeah, the B-52 requires a lot of actual flying as opposed to a lot of the newer airframes. Oh, that's there. nice. Well, what I'd like to do is just kind of do a walk around and, and kind of talk about some of the salient features of this plane. Are you cool with that? Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's go see. We're standing here in front of the monster engines on the B-52. Captain Arpin, tell us about these things. All right, so we're standing in front of engines number one and two of the B-52, which iconically has eight of these TF-33 turbofan engines. Now, we've been seeing these guys take off all day long, and they're super smoky. What's going on with that? Generally, because these are uh, a slightly lower efficiency engine that you're, than you're used to seeing today, and uh, what you're seeing is actually a little bit of the imperfect burn coming out of the back of the engine. Uh, we can carry up to 290,000 pounds of gas uh, as a full fuel load. So, just in comparison, my super awesome Subaru Crosstrek holds a whopping 16 gallons. That's a whole lot of Subarus in that plane right there. And you guys refuel in the air all the time. Yeah. No big deal. Very typically on most training sorties and uh, definitely on any sortie that we're taking out any further than outside of the continental US. That's awesome. Well, let's keep walking around because there's way more that we want to talk about. We're in the Bombay right now. And this thing, this looks really super scary. What is this? So what we're looking at here is called the conventional rotary launcher. It's actually one of the newer features that we have, um, and it allows us to drop JDAM and other precision guided munitions where okay. we actually have the capability to talk to the weapons uh, from the bomb bay, whereas what we used to do is only release our gravity weapons, so really no, con no uh, inertial guidance, no any kind of guidance uh, out of the bomb bay. So this gives us the capability now to launch smart weapons out of the bomb bay. Um, and allows us to really increase the overall amount of smart weapons. So we can all break. these plugs literally get plugged into the, the weapon and then the weapon and the plane talk to one another. That's correct. So all these, oh. there's a plug at every single one of the eight stations, uh, which can carry up to a 2000 pound smart weapon. Uh, so each one of these plugs actually allows the weapon to talk to the aircraft and allows us to program into that weapon in flight where we want it to go. Taking a tour around this aircraft got me to thinking, how much of the aircraft is original? Well, everything you're looking at on the outside is actually from the 1960s. Yeah, the tech on the inside has been replaced, but considering there's no Boeing store you can go to and say, hey, I need a new front landing gear, maintaining this old girl for over 50 years is impressive. Oh, big difference though, the tail. So one of the things I really wanted to point out was this guy, the tail. Ours is a B-52B, which means it's got quad 50s in the back. This has got nothing. What you definitely notice here is absolutely correct. They've removed the gunner position, and it really uh, kind of came about when we realized that there's really not much more a gunner could really do for us in the <laughs> yeah. way of defense with long range missiles and, and stuff like that to defend against. Yeah, no a gunner kidding. really isn't gonna take care of that. I am loving this. I could spend all day checking this out, but I really want to see the inside. Can we go do that? Well, as you can see behind me, Matt, we've got a little bit of active uh, maintenance going on, so we can't check it out right now, but we can come back later. And when we do, I'm going to bring out a full B-52 crew and they can show you around the crew compartments and talk to you a little bit about what they do in the Seriously? aircraft. Seriously? Okay. I can probably wait for that. Maybe. 
Waiting for the B-52 crew to get ready, I headed out to the flight line to watch some B-52s take off. Man, to actually see these guys fly was amazing. Big, yes. A bit smoky, yeah. But what do you expect from a plane that your grandfather could have flown in? Back inside Dock 8, it was time to meet up with Arpin's crew and get a tour of the inside of the plane. Up first, we joined Captain Henry in the cockpit. This really doesn't look that much different than the aircraft that we have at the museum. No, and it, and it wouldn't. Um, she's She's got some new tricks, um, but she has not changed a lot as far as just the uh, the aesthetics internal to the jet. <laughs> so um, we have our you know, our ADIs, our altimeters, VVI, things you would expect to see in a, you know, your normal right. your aircraft. Um, but as far as systems are concerned, uh, some of your systems that keep the, the jet operating, we have our hydraulics off to the left-hand side there. And then you've got oh, okay. your instrumentation right here for what's going on with the engines. Um, you've got oil pressure up across the eyebrow panel here. We've got electrics off to our right-hand side here as well. So kind of some, some big picture systems. It does look so similar to what we have, and our and ours is literally the second oldest. Yep, it, it really does look uh, look the same, but uh, this this old girl still has some teeth on her, and she yeah, still goes out and uh, does the mission. So yeah, well, like they yep. say, this is your grandfather's B fifty two. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. I think what we're going to do is we're going to climb around and see some of the other positions. Okay, sounds great, Matt. Have a great time. Okay, Sarah. Where are we? Well, Matt, we are in the electronic suite of the B-52. So we also have the retired gunner position sitting next to me. We are upstairs facing backwards behind the pilot and the co-pilot. All right, so what exactly do you do as an EWO? Obviously, with the gray curtain behind me, a lot of my equipment is classified, but what I do, my primary mission is defense of the jet and defense of the crew. If you go around the world, each country has surface-to-air missiles, better known as SAMs. Right. And when they want to take a shot at an aircraft that's thousands of feet in the air, they have to radiate with a radar. Each threat system has an original sound to it, and we study those so that we can identify it as soon as possible on board. So when you say you listen to it, are you getting a tone? Yeah, so we have our headset on. We get audio. Um, a lot of people in our career field will call it the beeps and squeaks. And... <laughs> Once I determine what threat or SAM that is, I apply the appropriate jamming package to it. So when they do take a shot, hopefully they miss. So literally through the beeps and squeaks, you can go, okay, that's an SA-21 or whatever. Correct. Wow. So you're pretty good at your job, aren't you? I try to be. There's a lot of studying. It, oh, I bet. Yeah. Well, and you've got a lot of people counting on you. Exactly. So this is the only crew compartment that has one individual. So there's a lot of pressure riding on it, but you also get a lot of reward too, because you're the one who's gonna bring the crew home. Very cool. Well, thank you for your service. Yeah. Okay, so I'm now in, let's just face it, a black box. Yep, black hole. Um, and I'm with newly minted Captain King Fisher. Yes, sir. Congratulations on the uh, promotion, oh, Captain. Thank you. <laughs> um, so tell me what you do down here in this very tiny black compartment. Yeah, so this is the, uh, we call it the offense compartment. It's where the navigators or the uh, weapon systems officers sit. Um, we work together because a lot of times we'll be trying to navigate and employ weapons at the same time. Um, hence, two people down here because uh, it can get kind of busy. But yeah, it's a, kind of our primary thing is to navigate and uh, work with the weapons. I noticed that you guys have the same kind of tunnel situation that we have. Do you guys ever go back there, or is it just kind of sealed up since there's no gunner? Oh, uh, we go back there. Really? Uh, not on every flight, but yeah, when we need to, uh, when we drop weapons out of the bay, if we're dropping, you know, like 27 gravity weapons out of the bay, we don't always have a way to verify that all of them released and that we don't have any weapons still back there. Okay. So in that case, what we'll do is we'll descend down and we'll depressurize, and then we'll send one of our crew members, one of our weapons qualified members, uh, back through that door and we'll go back into the bomb bay and make sure all the weapons are gone. And then uh, we call back here and, uh, you know, I think the Lord was still alive. No, <laughs> no it's, it's not too bad. How's it like flying in this box? You know, I, I personally love it. It's one of those things you, you get used to. Um, I mean, there's a lot going on in here, I'm sure. There's a lot going on, and then you don't have windows. Uh, we have a floor which uh, works on most jets, uh, so <laughs> you can kind of get something of a picture outside, but for the most part when you're banking and turning, 
and it's dark down here. Uh, it's fun. I, I like it. I enjoy it. I, would, I don't want to do anything else. So. Well, excellent. Well, I am going to stay here for the next month or so. Um, I think the camera crew might go out and film other stuff. But There's I'm... actually like enough room down here to lay down and sleep. If, oh, uh, seriously? Yeah, oh, I am totally moving in. Yeah, yeah. Totally moving in. Yeah, yeah. I think it'll be just fine. <laughs> This is an aviation icon, a timeless aircraft that has been literally flying for generations. From crawling through the second oldest B-52 in existence to watching active B-52s take off at Minot Air Force Base, and even taking a tour inside with a full crew, we've taken you behind the wings of the B-52 Stratofortress. I can't talk in the cold. Captain Archer. <laughs> <laughs>